Well, I'm going to pick up exactly where Leon left off uh, with a very technical looking slide to uh, provide a little bit more detail um, underpinning uh, the third headline finding. Um, and to look at the slide, I'd like people to pay very close attention to the colors. Um, uh, if you look at the middle uh, graph, you'll see uh, behavior and to the uh, far right of the behavior section is teal. That is a program that has established uh, evidence of, of actually replicating its findings. And then the green next to it is a good evidence program. And the reason I want you to pay close attention to that is because those colors change across uh, the three domains that we're looking at, attachment, behavior, and cognitive development. In particular, as Leanne just pointed out, there is a much greater proportion of programs uh, targeting children's behavior that has a good, if not established, evidence base. And I will be talking about that a little bit further. Before we do that, we're doing this in the sequence of ABC. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about attachment security. As Leanne mentioned, this is a very important uh, feature of children's development. It is about import, uh, uh, forming happy and healthy relationships with um, other people. Um, starting off with the primary caregiver. Um, parents facilitate a secure attachment by uh, responding sensitively and appropriately to their children's needs. And by doing that, children um, uh, come to have positive expectations about the world and themselves, and people believe this is a very important protective factor as children become older. Uh, in fact, uh, recent findings from the Minnesota Longitudinal Study observed that sensitive parenting in the first year within the attachment context predicts um, relationship satisfaction when uh, children are adults at age 30. The good news here is that the majority of parents are very good at supporting attachment security in their children. Across the entire population, it's about two-thirds of the parents do this, and they don't need to be taught how to do this. They don't need any kind of training or any additional help. Uh, if you look at uh, populations involving um, middle income or upper income populations, it's up to 75%. However, a minority will struggle, and they'll struggle for all the usual reasons. That is social disadvantage, single parenthood, an unwanted pregnancy, uh, age, particularly young parenthood, uh, relationship problems, and mental health. In fact, parental mental health is the number one predictor of difficulties in the attachment relationship. Going back to the pyramid that uh, Leanne first introduced, we have our continuum of services starting at the bottom at the universal level and going up to the specialist. As he said, we don't talk about specialist programs in this review. We're going to save that for other ones. Um, but uh, I've assigned colors to these to c provide somewhat uh, an indication of what's needed in terms of the red, amber, green. At the bottom, universal services as we have, know them right now seem to be good enough for the attachment relationship. This is partially because most parents know what to do. Um, if you s see the workshop that I'm involved in later on today, you will see a picture of my uncle at age 73 supporting a positive attachment relationship in his, his six-week child. Uh, maybe age helped him to do that, but it's something that comes quite naturally. However, once you start having higher levels of risk, you put the attachment relationship at risk as well, so we need more programs in each of those areas. This is what we found in terms of levels of activity, and that broadly reflects the level of need, so that's good. But then when we look at what we found to be evidence-based, that's not so good. We, in fact, found only um, five evidence-based attachment-related programs out of, um, I believe it was originally 28. Um, the three at the top at the targeted indicated uh, level are, in fact, three versions of the same program, which is a very specific kind of parent-infant psychotherapy, uh, which again we'll talk about later on this afternoon. It's not the one that was in the news yesterday, uh, but it is a very, it's a small subset of that. Uh, then uh, going down, we found one targeted selective intervention. That's the Family Nurse Partnership Program. 
uh, which continued, it didn't do so well in the UK trial, but it did observe important um, outcomes in children's cognitive development. And in other trials in the United States, it has good evidence of supporting the attachment relationship. And then at the bottom, we found also surprisingly one universal intervention that supported attachment-related behaviors and children's uh, behavior as they grew older. That's the Family Foundations program that is for couples expecting their first child. Uh, couples go to uh, 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 a, a course that is embedded within childbirth courses before the baby is born and then attend four more sessions afterwards where they learn strategies to work together as a couple to respond appropriately to their child's needs. Uh, we also found two programs that did not have evidence of working. Um, both of these were home visiting programs. Both of these programs targeted uh, various levels of work risk, one at the targeted selective uh, level. It's a model similar to Family Nurse Partnership, uh, but not quite as specific. And the second is uh, at the targeted indicated level. Uh, this is for uh, mothers who were identified as having or being at risk of postpartum uh, uh, depression uh, in the, uh, the second trimester of pregnancy. Uh, neither one of these programs was able to confirm any um, child outcomes and a conclusion of the authors of both studies was that greater targeting was necessary. And I think that this goes back to Mark's point earlier today is we are looking for more personalization here. Both of the programs are using that evidence to redevelop their models to, to um, ensure that more targeting takes place within the, the, the larger model. So we believe that's an important message. So just to recap, and I'm going to do this really quickly, there is a high need for attachment-based <coughs> programs. We found only five. Um, these are the ones uh, that are more effective for vulnerable families, um, also tend to be very intensive. Many of these last for over a year or longer. That means that they are high-cost programs but some of the best evidence ones also have good evidence of improving high cost outcomes, including child maltreatment. Now to move on quickly to behavior. Again, I start with a very technical looking graph and I want you to pay attention to the number one there because that means one years. That is a child's level of aggression at age one and it is pretty low but there's a rapid increase between the ages of one and two in terms of aggressive and non-compliant child behaviors. And in fact, a two-year-old child is probably more aggressive than he or she will be at any other point in his or her life. Uh, Carrie likes me to tell, remind people that it's very important then not to give two-year-olds weapons. <laughs> You see then we have a bifurcation in the graph. The purple line is normal development. Most children outgrow this, and in fact, they outgrow this very rapidly. Uh, they do it with some help from their parents, but as you see, by the time that they're five years old, they're more or less the same as they were as infants. However, other children be can become much, much more aggressive and will remain more aggressive throughout uh, their childhood and in adulthood. Uh, the good news, once again, is that parents are pretty good at taming their toddlers. It's not fun, I know, but it, is, it, they, they, it, it can be done, and most of us do it adequately. But some will continue to struggle, and the factors that um, make it difficult for parents as a kid with particular difficult temperament, uh, language delays, that's because kids will resort to physical behaviors um, to express themselves. And then what is known as coercive parenting behaviors. And that is a parent responding to aggressive behavior with more aggression. aggression. So you get these coercive cycles. It's kind of a really negative word for something that happens quite naturally and for natural reasons, but they, they, it happens nevertheless and we find that those sorts of um, coercive parenting behaviors actually increase or accelerate aggressive behaviors in children. So the majority of the interventions that we looked at in this category aimed to change those um, coercive cycles by teaching parents uh, other strategies for dealing with non-compliant child behavior. Once again, we're back to our pyramid, and we see that because parents, by and large, are pretty good at doing this, the need for universal interventions covering uh, parenting behaviors 
uh, might not be that high, but I'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, the targeted selective level, uh, again, it's, it's not clear what, those, uh, what the basis of uh, targeting would be, but we certainly know that at the targeted indicated level, when children are expressing behavioral problems still at the age of three, these interventions are probably uh, going to be quite necessary. This is the distribution of the uh, programs that we observed falling in the behavioral self-regulation category. Uh, so it's, it that didn't entirely match what we thought was needed because there were quite a few universal interventions. In terms of what we found to be effective, and I should, that's not a 71 there, that's a 7 and a 1, we found uh, 8 interventions with good or established evidence of being effective and uh, 2 selective interventions uh, that, that had also good evidence. I'd like to point out that that 1 there is a program that has been in the UK for a while. It is the Incredible Years program. And it also has evidence of um, keeping uh, the, the good gains that were achieved early on in children's behavior them lasting for over 10 years. However, that is only when the program has been implemented as a targeted indicated intervention. It, it was not observed for families who received the intervention uh, at, at the selective level, even though those families also sh uh, demonstrated shorter term gains. And this is something that we see in programs again and again and again. As Leanne pointed out, at the indicated level, the, the effects are stronger and they appear to last longer. We also found two programs that uh, had no effect on any measured EIF child outcome. And one of these programs is particularly noteworthy because it was developed to actually prevent uh, child non-compliant behavior from occurring in the first place by visiting parents in their home over three sessions at eight months, uh, 15 months, and then again at 24 months. This is a program that was developed in Australia. It doesn't exist anymore. It was called Toddlers Without Tears. And they found that it made no difference with the onset of non-compliant behavior, and it made no difference to how the parents responded to their children, even though the parents felt more confident. And the authors of that study concluded that the reason the program failed was, A, it wasn't intensive enough for the families who needed it the most, and B, that parents, in order to learn these skills, they need to have opportunities to master them on the child when the child is the appropriate age. So this, for behavioral interventions, it's likely that age makes a big difference. We'll move on to cognitive development then. This is about children's early learning. Uh, as uh, Leanne pointed out er earlier, children learn naturally by interacting with their environment, but parents can facilitate this learning with, uh, in terms of how they interact with their child. We call this scaffolding. Uh, the majority of parents, again, are pretty good at doing this, particularly in middle income and upper income families. Um, however, there a strong and persistent difference exists in terms of the cognitive outcomes of children in lower income families. Uh, and we also know that language delays are apparent in, uh, at the targeted indicated level in um, children in all income brackets. Back to our pyramid then, we see the high need both at the targeted selective and targeted indicated level. And we find, however, that um, there are, are probably not enough targeted indicated programs um, and more activity in the targeted indicated le uh, selective level. But when we uh, look closely, we only found two effective interventions. We should add, though, that when we look at some of the outcomes from some of the attachment programs, that could go up to uh, three more, so five in total, because some of those attachment programs, as I pointed out, Family Nurse Partnership also um, identified some uh, positive learning outcomes. But as you can set, see, we have 17 interventions with uh, good or better evidence of being effective, and we feel that, that th there's a lot of heterogeneity there, so there is some good choice. There is less choice, however, in terms of attachment interventions and um, programs uh, addressing children's early cognition. Thank you. Very much.